Uh, like uh, Daniel Best from Sino Collective. Mm -hmm. he, he was the first person to discover a tune we did called Midnight Marauders. And, uh, it came out in 2003, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of ours, a recluse, uh, who used to live uh, in Detroit, moved, he fell in love with a girl and moved to New Zealand, set himself up there, and uh, but was still selling records and doing well in the rest of the world. And when he went off to do a European tour, I gave him, sent him off with uh, 10 copies of Midnight Marauders, and he just handed them out. And then uh, when he was in Germany, uh, got the record to Daniel Best from Best Seven and Sonar, and um, they loved the kind of, Fusion of uh, soul and reggae, mm. and um, that's kind of where it's, that's kind of where it started for us outside of New Zealand. Cool. So the bottom line is, you must be knackered. You must be tired. Yeah, I mean we. Because it's been full on for you guys since 2001, right? I mean, especially for yourself, because I think definitely, I mean, from what I can see, from what I've read, and um, it seems a kind of consistent being in the studio, live gigs doing these kind of small EPs and making this album, taking you 18 months to this album. I mean, you know, is your head clear at the moment? Well, it's good being here because I've sort of uh, managed to escape the studio, mm -hmm. uh, escape, I've, I've, I have a family, uh, get a break from that for a bit. And, um, but yeah, that, that's kind of life at the moment is if I'm not in the studio, then we're on the road with nine of us on the road, traveling, trying to push the record around Gosh. the rest of the world. So I think from so from 2001 was the beach, you know, your studio was was that pretty much been the HQ for Fat Freddy Shop since then? Yeah, out of uh, seven us, seven of us in the band, um, I've always been the one with the most interest in uh, the studio uh, side of it, and I've slowly over the last sort of five years built up a nice little um, home studio situated underneath uh, a house and. Mm -hmm. I live in a, I'm lucky to live in a, a beautiful spot in Wellington, which is like from here. Oops, sorry, from here to the wall. I could, yeah, it's the water, it's the okay. sea, and uh, our studio uh, you know, looks out over the water. And um, and we didn't really want to uh, go to some sort of bigger, flasher studio and, and record our stuff. We wanted to one learn about uh, the recording process. Um, to maintain the control of it, and three, just sort of take our time. So we just sort of, uh, just, I've been throwing all my money and my energy into making sure we've got enough gear in my basement to take care of all our recording. Sure. So apart from doing the, you know, studio thing um, and the live gigs, is that pretty much your bag in terms of how you earn your living, how you kind of manage yourself and the band? Yeah, well, yeah, it's kind of been working slowly towards being able to be a professional engineer or musician, and that's only been the last sort of couple of years I've managed to, to get that situation happen where all I'm doing is music and that's mainly, mainly, mainly focused around Fat Freddy's Drop. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, the making of your album, it took 18 months and you're saying that, it, was it um, a reflection of your live shows you're saying? I, I think um, it, it took 18 months because we were on the road a lot as well but... Um, so how did it work? Did you have a kind of... Okay. Uh, we would sort of in the initial periods just jam a lot and record the jams and then um, and then unfortunately get interrupted by having to go on the road and do, go do touring and then come back and try and pick up where we left and so it was a, a wee bit sort of sporadic and uh, interrupted for the first half of that 18 months and then we kind of decided in the latter part of that just to go we've got to sit down and nail it. And, we're basically getting sick of, sick of getting harassed by the New Zealand public as to where the album was, so we kind of had, had to sort of uh, push on and get it finished. But it must be a good feeling uh, knowing that you're wanted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 New Zealand's a small place, so the word gets back to you pretty easily and pretty quickly when people want something. <laughs> sure. So I guess um, something I, I thought was really, really good was the fact that, you know, in terms of your newer members of the bands, they, they're actually members per se. I mean, a lot of bands, for example, have core members and they might introduce their drummer or keyboard player when it comes to writing the album or performing live or whatever, but you guys pretty much kept and, and I guess evolving in, in terms of your um, band member structure. I think that's quite a unique thing. I mean, has that always been your policy to kind of introduce? Yeah, them? I think it's an unwritten policy with us that every person that's involved with our music project is very much an equal 
member of the project, uh, both creatively and financially, and I think that's a really important part of and why we've lasted this long and why hopefully we will continue to maintain the vibe because everybody that's involved uh, feels like they, you know, they're they in there and um, has something to contribute to the project and um, yeah I think the longevity of the band will definitely be reflected by that policy I think. Oh I would definitely agree with that but in terms of um, I guess there's one thing to be said about being on stage and having a kind of improvisational approach to being on stage and making music but at some point decisions need to be made particularly when it comes to making a studio album. So how does that, you know, I guess you're the person in the band who has to, because you're the producer, I guess, somebody yeah. has to kind of steer the reins in some respect. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's why the album took so long to make. Because uh, we are born on the stage, that's kind of where we came from, and having to uh, learn to write music and arrangements that were restricted to sort of shorter lengths was was quite a tough process for us uh, as a band to learn how to do and that's kind of uh, when we were writing the album went down many roads and had to retract and come back and we're just trying to find a process, it was mainly just trying to find a process that suited uh, a band that was pretty much just a live improv band to coming up with uh, appropriate length arrangements for an album uh, yeah. that was probably why it took a long time to do and um, and how, how it worked in the studio with the, having to make tough decisions is that kind of uh, I, I was definitely steering the um, the production and the uh, the studio and the engineering side of the album, but it pretty much came down to because uh, we were a democratic band. It pretty much came down to whoever was prepared to stay in the studio the longest <laughs> uh, pretty much got their idea in there. Because I mean, that was, the, the whole, whole process for us is trying to include everybody in the band and everyone, everybody's ideas, everybody's melodies, everybody's arrangements and it was kind of like uh, one of those competitions where you're at a radio station you've got to keep your hand on the car and you win the car, if you, whoever keeps their hand they're the longest, someone who's there like four days later. That's kind of how things happen and it's just very natural but if you're stubborn and you stay in the studio and you, you're there at five in the morning then you've got a better chance of your ideas to you know, get into the finals. But haven't you got an unfair advantage? Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I can disappear, go upstairs, <laughs> have a sleep and come back. But um. <laughs> What was the um, most challenging track on the album to actually put together? We'll, we'll, we'll listen to it a bit later. But. Um, uh, half of it, I found the whole thing quite challenging. The songs... The ones that were quite uh, hard were the ones that the ones that went off the most live, which we really had nailed live, were the hardest ones to produce for the record. Tracks like Wandering Eye, um, they just had such a live feel. Trying to, like I said, trying to find that process of trying to maintain that live vibe uh, within a record. They, they, they were the kind of the hard ones. Um, the most fun ones were things tracks like Ray Ray, which I'll, I'll play a bit later on, which. Probably a wee bit more from where I'm from, uh, and the fact that it's, it was completely constructed in the computer, uh, in Pro Tools and the MPC, and uh, being able to sit in front of the computer for, for days, so tinkering away. No, I have got I've got a version of it in the MPC, and I've got a yeah. Oh. Should we hear that? Yeah, if we hear that. So you can't tell me that um, half of New Zealand's music industry isn't sniffing at you, trying to sign you? Yeah, we've had uh, the major labels uh, in New Zealand sniffing around the live gigs for a long time, but we've always, um, as with the music, we're, we're right into being self-sufficient and, and into the business side of things as well. And um, being independent to us is incredibly important. Um, Why is that? Mainly because, um, for many reasons, but the main two is to completely control um, how we're perceived in the public and how we do things. Uh, and secondly, 
within New Zealand just just doesn't make sense to sign to a label when we've uh, done all the groundwork, we've uh, played lots of live gigs, people know who we are, uh, why, why would we give away you know, 75% of the cash mm -hmm. to a major label that um, wastes money, spending money on bad marketing uh, budgets, bad video ideas, um, you know, there's, there's no point. We, we, we get to see uh, a very big chunk of all the music that we sell. Mm -hmm. and, um, so the maths just doesn't make sense to go to a major level, you know, the make our money and keep it, you know. Oh, yeah. So in terms of infrastructure, I mean, do you do you um, responsible for the business side as well? Yeah, um, we're, uh, my partner, uh, Nicole, uh, who also lives at the beach, uh, she runs, um, she's the business manager for The Drop, which is uh, a little company which is essentially myself and her who manage all the financial business dealings to do with that British drop and um, I kind of run the gigs and the bookings and uh, that side of things and, and my partner runs, uh, runs the checkbook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As women should. They're much better than <laughs> yeah, they're much spending better. on equipment or something. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's true, man. <laughs> wow, okay. So, in terms of being independent in New Zealand, I mean, obviously you're very well known in New Zealand and you've obviously developed some kind of partnerships with other com com companies in different countries. Can you go into how, how that's been for you? In yeah, terms well, of relationship with, say, Sony Collective, licensing the album? Yeah, yeah we, we decided to not to give it away to one person outside of New Zealand and Australia. The Drop takes care of New Zealand and Australia and we have a, an English manager who set up a little label just to, to look after the record in England called uh, Cartel, um, this guy called Charlie, Charlie Walsh. Um, How did you hook up with him? Um, he was dealing with another uh, label back in New Zealand called Loop Recordings. We were doing a lot of um, electronic stuff and kind of on our tours through the UK, met him and kind of thought he'd be a good person to hook up with. And um, So we've kind of been, as far as distribution and, and hooking up with other labels. We've kind of been uh, it's very much sort of dipping our feet kind of approach. We'll hook up with someone and like in the gas territories, we've gone with Sonar Collective. Um, Cartel's kind of managing the UK and the rest of Europe and uh, we're currently looking for someone in Japan and um, and trying to talk to some people here in the States. But trying uh, more of an approach of not having one person looking after the rest of the world, mainly for the reason that if it all turns to ship with that one person, then we're, we're kind of, we're rooted, so it's probably better for us to have someone taking, like if the, pe if the people in Germany screw it up and it's only screwed up for Germany and it's not screwed up for everyone else, you know, just trying to uh, keep our eggs in many baskets, so kind of share the risk. And so far, has this been fruitful? I suppose that's where we're at at the moment. Um, it's, it's looking good, mm -hmm. uh, but um, we're, we're at a stage in the Fat Freddy's career that we're, we're, we're trying to we're trying to sell records outside of New Zealand. So we're kind of that's what that's where we're at, we are right now, in the middle of that. So, and for us, that means uh, just constantly touring through the for, at, at this point, just Europe and the UK. Have you ch um, how many tours have you had in Europe? Your, your um, we've done four. Wow. Yeah. Which is quite a big deal for us because one, it's you know it's kind of on the seventeen thousand miles away from New Zealand, and um, our, our live shows is f you know fairly fairly produced and fairly high tech. So mm. it's we have to travel with uh, we travel with our own sound engineer. We have seven people on the band. So we have managers, and you know, it's, it's at least nine nine on the road. Gosh. And we're not, the band's not a young band, uh, most of the, half the band have got kids and have families and um, at some point in a, in a two or three month tour you have to bring over your partner and your kid at some point and, and you know. Okay, I didn't know that part. Yeah, right. So bottom line, it's in terms of earning a living and maintaining the band, it's all about the live shows, right? Yeah. So it's like, it must be a challenge. 
Yeah, I mean, the live shows are very... Uh, yeah, we've been to... We've travelled from New Zealand to the UK for, like I said, four times now, and the last tour was the only one that broke even. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, so we're looking from here on to, to hopefully start making money out of touring. I mean, we, we, we do very well in New Zealand. We can tour and play and make really good money in Australia and in, in New Zealand, but uh, we have to because we pretty much just throw it all at touring outside of those territories because uh, it's... Yeah, we're, st we're still slowly getting a name, but it's not enough of a name to, to draw big fees to cover the travel of nine people. You know? Gotcha. Um, in, in this day and age, I mean, it's surprising to have even a band of three or four people, do you know what I mean, of, you know, mm. who aren't, say, top 40 or whatever. So, I mean, is that your goal, to kind of, you know, be pop stars? No, we don't want to be... I don't, I don't think we Why can. not? Uh, we, I think there's enough... There's, you know, there's different tiers of business that, in the music business, and there's obviously the... Uh, the, the top level where they're making a lot of shit, stupid money. But I think there's a level where you can uh, maintain some integrity and just make good music and still make nine minute, ten minute tracks and hopefully still sell enough CDs to, to make a bit of a living. Uh, we're going to just want to sit, sit in there and maybe at the higher end, higher end of that is probably the aim, I think. I, I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we were ever to expect to become... Maybe the, our, lead, our lead singer might take off and, <laughs> and do that, but... Uh, yeah, do some R&B things. Yeah, do some R&B. <laughs> what do you think? I see your, your brain was just going somewhere right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering where our lead singer is right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you currently, um, wait, apart from you know, this album coming out, because the album did quite well, right? In terms of, I know it went double platinum in New Zealand. You won the whole heap of awards, didn't you? Did yeah, you? yeah, we, um, we sort of kicked up a bit of a ruckus in New Zealand uh, a few months ago. We, we got asked in, like a, at the start of the year to be involved in the, um, the local main music awards uh, for New Zealand. And, it, and we actually were thinking it was, uh, initially, no, we don't want to get involved with that rubbish. It's, it's all mainstream. Uh, just, it's just not us, and then kind of changed their mind because I think uh, we're, in a, we're in a position to hopefully change things in the music scene in New Zealand, uh, and would be just a wee bit stubborn and a wee bit uh, negative to to do that. So we decided, to, so we thought we might win one or two awards. We're up for four, and um, it would be good to go in there and fly the flag for independent music and try and you know come in and, and, and take off with a few awards and. And it kind of, that's, that's kind of what happened. We, we snuck in there and won four, two of the, two of them, the main awards, and um, and that, that was very rare for. Uh, I, don't, I can't think of any other bands in recent history that were independent, not signed to a major, and to sort of pick up pick up some awards. So did you have to stand there and, and receive this award? Yeah, we had to yeah. get up and. Did you have to dress up, or did you just? Uh, you we, were, we, were look, and... we were we were pretty looking pretty motley. Okay. We just kind of got up and we didn't even really have any plans for any speeches and, um, but yeah, we, we just kind of maintained our kind of low-key vibe and mm -hmm. were humble and took our awards and walked off stage. So in terms of being in that awards and, you, you know, for you, it's all about the beach where you're at, your HQ, to be in a place where you're, in, you're surrounded with industry people who you loathe, so to speak. I mean, how did you feel being at that award where, you know, this award's obviously got accolades and it's good to get accolades, but the bottom line, the industry is very much not where you want to be in terms of the whole major label thing? Not really, but I mean, I think the whole, I think even globally, I think uh, the business model for the music industry is all changing everywhere. And I think uh, we, we, can be, we can be of help to ourselves, we can be of help to people that are coming up uh, in, in, in the New Zealand music industry to help get things changed. I mean, it's all, for, for many reasons, uh, the industry's changing f with the availability of the music via the net and, and, and all that, all that's changing. So it, I think we owe it to ourselves and to, the, to other people to, to get in there and, uh, and encourage change in the music industry. And um, that's kind of was the whole reason for us to even accept our nominations for those awards recently, you know, was to 
try and get in there and, um, and make it easier for uh, more independent people to make music and get it out there and not get, not get ripped off and signed by major labels, you know. So the Nets helped you a lot, you would say? It's definitely helped us, not financially, but uh, directly financially, but for as far as getting our music out there to the rest of the world, getting it, because uh, New Zealand's a long way away, and I think for, for small countries like New Zealand that are on the other side of the world, uh, uh, they're the people that the net helps the most, I think, is, is you know, getting the music out there. So what's next for you in terms of, are you working on a new album? Yeah, playing? I think uh, we're, we we get back to I get back to New Zealand home for two weeks and then we head off to uh, we just got a real short quick tour of uh, places like Hamburg, Cologne, Germany, the, most of Germany through to the UK, just a, seven gigs in a row, uh, and then we come back after that we come back to New Zealand and we'll be in New Zealand for till the next European summer. So throughout that period. Um, We'll start to work on the new album, and I think for us working on a new album is uh, dialing up some new samples on the NPC uh, and having a bit of a jam on stage and trying to write some new songs. We kind of write our songs on the stage, just a simple idea, simple melody, and then um, and hopefully three or four gigs later, it's starting to turn into a bit of a tune. And uh, you know, the first few, first few times it'll probably be a, be a flop. Sure. And that's cool. And um, so we'll do that process for our, our, our summer. We'll kind of uh, workshop tunes live. Because uh, we've, we've, we've got a pretty busy tour back home, so okay. um, plenty of time to workshop some tunes. And then once we've done that, we'll um, probably come back to the studio and start turning them into the second album. So do you record, eat, obviously you record all your live shows? Yeah, we, we travel. We, we, we travel with a, a, our own live uh, front of house engineer. And he, he has a laptop out okay. front and records it all. And do you use that information, that audio for, for the live show, or for the actual studio album, or do you...? Uh, it's more a reference, but uh, it's, it's definitely not uh, unheard of to that we might... There might be a little breakdown uh, in the middle of the show, but it's just, it's just down to a couple of instruments, and that, that they become a loop that's a part of the, the track, for sure. OK. Will there ever be a three and a half minute Fat Freddy's top tune? Not by us. I think we'll maybe have to farm out the parts to someone else to, to, to do a to do a radio edit. Um, but yeah, I can't. I don't think we, it's a, we just we just can't write anything less than four minutes, five minutes. <laughs> Is that can't or won't? A bit of both. A bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like that tune I just played before. That kind of has four main sections and a bit of an outro jam uh, and. But that, that started with eight main sections and, okay. and you know, because you've got seven or eight people involved in the writing process and uh, like I said earlier, it's whoever, whoever hangs around the longest on that night in the studio and the mix down was who, who was going to get their section in there. And is there, in terms of like trying to get your creative perspective on the track, is there kind of like any tips and tricks that you want to share with us, you know, in terms of getting your snare drum in there or getting your bass melody in there? Yeah, I mean, with for the the drum side of it, I, I yeah, uh, like you said earlier, I, I kind of have the advantage of living there. So, you know, when everyone takes off, and I'll change it all and come back in the morning. <laughs> hopefully, they haven't really noticed it too much. So, seven heads in a studio making music it must be quite a challenge at some time. So sometimes. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. At, um, it's 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 not always pretty. It's, it's definitely in that process uh, of doing this this album. With many tears, and um, but I think you know that's just that's just the, that that's a good thing. I think uh, out of those tears comes some, some good magic and some and some good decisions, and you just have to go through that process of uh, of confrontation uh, to get to the to get to the, what you really need to have on the tune. And what would you say would be the um, the thing that was the most thought about in terms of direction and was it more? Was it more the direction thing? Or yeah, it more it's more. Uh, usually, those uh, difficult moments come quite early in the piece as to where the direction of the tune should be going. Mm -hmm. Once we've all had our fight and and, and we've we decided to go down this particular route with in style for, for for this tune, we usually lock in and are on the same page. But what, um, 
but yeah, it's, it's usually it's usually a, a stylistic or a vibe kind of argument earlier on as to where the tune should go. But once we've once we've sorted that out, then it's it's usually pretty straightforward. So um, I guess in the recordings, is there kind of <laughs> kind of like yeah, there's plenty there's plenty of outtakes. For sure. <laughs> there's another album for me. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So you said you had something on the MPC. Oh uh, yeah, maybe I was just going to illustrate um, because yeah, just to explain, we don't we don't have a. Um, when we play live, we don't have a drummer or a bass player at all. It's uh, the rhythms and the bass lines usually start from here, uh, from the MPC, and um, and uh, over the top we have a three-piece three -piece horn section. There's trumpet, saxophone, trombone, electric, and acoustic guitar, which is the same person, um, uh, a singer, and a keyboard player. And um, I'm just going to kind of simply illustrate how we kind of play live. On the other eight channels that I have on the desk, I actually take a, a feed from every mic on stage. Okay. And, um, and that's really just, I don't mix the band on stage, I just take every mic just so I can uh, access the alliance for doing the echoes and delays and reverbs. Mm -hmm. And what I'm sending back to the front of house engineer is um, three lines that will be the left and right from my mixer and, um, and then just a separate effect send, a mono effect send, which are the delays only. And I'll just go mental on stage with the delays. And the front of house engineer is actually out front balancing it up and he'll, you know, he'll decide that I'm just going a bit too mental and pull my channel out. Well, if, I'm, if it's working, then he'll bring it up. Sure. And I think I'm sure half the time he's got it down. And I guess you go mental. You go. <laughs> you go mental quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, hopefully you will get to see a Fat show at some point. It's, it's kind of think at this point is what we we're best at is playing live. And um, we've kind of we're part way there with the album. Of making those saying that's the process of trying to become a uh, that made that transition from being a live band to a studio recording was very hard and I think we kind of got part way there with this album and we I think the best is yet to come and I think uh, we're going to go for a slightly different process for the next album. What was the most challenging thing about trying to get the live vibe on the, on the album? Well, just when you when you um, we kind of did things in a weird. Um, We've done everything in a, in, a, in a strange order, I reckon. We've become a very popular live band and then trying to make turn those into a record, whereas normally people write a, a great tune and then, they, and then they develop that tune into a great live show. We've done it the other way around. And, um, so it's hard when you've written something on stage and you go out and you play it to people when it just goes off. And you know you've got a room, whether it's three, 300 or whether it's 2,000, just rocking to your live show. And then you get in the studio and you write a tune. You know, you're just going, it's, just, it's, just, it's, not, it's not the same, you know. It's not the same as being eight people in the studio listening to your monitors as to playing live in front of 2,000 people and yeah, right. rocking the house. It's trying to make that, uh, trying to make that transition was, has always been quite hard. Yeah, you know, there's just the vibe. It's just not the same in the studio as it is on, on stage, you know? Sure. But then, is, wouldn't it be about maybe trying to capture some of that, you know, maybe including some of the improvised recordings from the... Yeah, well, I think uh, that's what I was saying. I think uh, mm. the process for the next album may, may be a wee bit different. I think uh, nothing set at the moment. We've, we've all, since done this album, I think a lot of the people in the band are quite in agreement that um, the next album uh, should be more... Uh, Recorded in a more old school approach, uh, with us all playing at the same time, okay. and actually writing arrangements uh, that are a little bit shorter, and then just playing them, and then taking the best take, and then doing a little bit of multi-track and studio manipulation later. But essentially, at the heart of it is, is a live take by everybody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll definitely explore those those processes in the, in the next album for sure. 
And do you think there'll be, will the NBC always be the master to beat, or do you think you'll look at... Yeah, I think, um, definitely for the live show. I think that gives us kind of our club edge, and definitely. the fact that we can, we can, we can go into a dirty little 250 people club with a big PA and, and, and do that kind of night, two in the morning set, or we can, um, or we can do the, the, the lovely four in the afternoon festival set, you know, we can, we've kind of got our bases covered and it also acts for me as a bit of a point of difference that we have from other people, so we, we, don't, we don't have a rhythm section, a live rhythm section, it is, and the fact that the, the bass lines and the beats are locked down, that the, the changes and the different colours actually come more melodically and they come from mm -hmm. the rest of the band as opposed to the accent being on field changes. Being, and, sure. And I mean, and with the, with the effects and you know the the the, the beat and the uh, and the stuff, it, it does move around a fair bit. It doesn't get doesn't get too too boring with the NPC. I've kind of hopefully I think I've learnt uh, over the years to keep, keep things interesting with with the NPC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you had um, any situations where the NPC has been a bit naughty? And, um, I've so been lucky. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a few years. Uh, since I've had a the EBC freeze on me in the middle of a set, it, it hasn't happened recently. That's actually the only thing I get nervous about, and I still get nervous about uh, before a gig is not performing in front of people or, or stuffing up. It's actually the EBC uh, freezing up is, is, is my only nightmare that I, I kind of have. But um, that's kind of why I use an EBC because it's just as it's solid and never, yes, never lets me. It's let me down probably five times in my whole career with Fat Fresh Drop, you know. Got you. And have you always, um, you know, known creative music with the NPC? Hmm. I kind of um, my main tools, uh, obviously live as the NPC. Uh, I kind of been working in Pro Tools for a long time. Um, like we had a conversation the other day, I've, I've kind of reached a point where I've been doing production for a long time and I've always managed to hide from MIDI. And I'm at a point now where I went and brought some software since the other day. And, oi, oi. <laughs> and about to sort of delve into that, that world. But um, up to this point, I've always been uh, programming on NPC, rolling it into Pro Tools as audio. And because uh, we've got seven musicians, uh, you know, six musicians, it's, it's always performance based and dealing with audio. Mm. Definitely a lot of editing, a lot of cutting up, but it's actually cutting up real audio as opposed to MIDI. You know? Sure. <clears throat> and do you think, obviously that'll bring a, um, bring a different writing approach in terms of using plugins or whatever? Yeah. It'd be, it'd, be it'd be a good one, trust me, it'd be all right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely one of, I think, mm. uh, kind of essentially maintaining the, the audio and NBC and Pro Tools side of things, but incorporating the MIDI uh, as a, an, an extra factor will definitely be useful, I think. And do you use much outboard in the studio? Um, no, I mainly work in the box, uh, mainly mix inside the computer, but th that's all about the change. I've kind of, um, yeah, mainly, mainly plugins, mainly uh, kind of concentrate. My front end, front end on Pro Tools is, pr is pretty good. I have uh, some really nice mic pre's. Some very nice mics and um, hire, hire in a couple of good compressors and uh, use Apogee converters. So essentially what's going into Pro Tools is pretty, pretty good. Okay. So I um, kind of feel, feel fairly confident in, in, in all the mixing that can kind of stay, stay in the box. But this is good because, I mean, you know, earlier you said that, you know, you basically learn as you went along, right? And you know you're already saying things in you know, Apogee compression. You know you already, you've obviously done some research in terms of what equipment to use, what's best out there. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, before pre Freddie's job, I've kind of I've, I've been I've always been uh, I was, I've worked in other studios before. I kind of set up my own my own gear. Where I worked in a very flash studio in Wellington and uh, had access to good gear. And um, yeah, I've, I've always been interested in, 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 in finding out um, how to record things really well and that, that's kind of that's that's kind of my world really definitely shows on the album yeah. I tell you sounds amazing oh, cheers 
So, the studio moo or the live moo? That's what we. That's the. That's our constant battle. It's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the Fat Freddy Strike battle. Is, uh, hopefully, in the next album, we'll work out how to capture, uh, you know, a bit of both. You know, a bit of good studio accuracy as as well as a bit of loose, you know, live vibe. And, Mm. Okay, has anyone got any questions? We got two questions. Um, first, it's just about the name Fat Freddy's Drop. Is it named after the Fury Freak Brothers? Um, that's kind of what we. That's kind of what we tell people. Okay. But I feel comfortable in telling you the truth. Um, we, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure they made it everywhere else in the world, but, but back in the day, uh, there was some acid, some LSD that came out to New Zealand called Fat Freddy's. And they were probably the, the best and the strongest acid that I've, I don't take acid anymore, but this is a long, 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 this is a long time ago. And um, myself and Toby, he's probably hiding over there somewhere, we, I don't think he was, he might not have been involved in acid, but um, me and the singer anyway definitely took some uh, these trips and uh, the very first version of a track called Hope uh, we did came off the back of a two or three day session on these favourites <laughs> and uh, that was the first thing we'd ever done and we didn't have a name, we are just tinkering around in our pretty basic studio at that point and uh, we gave it to the local radio station because they had a 21st it was the 21st birthday of one of the local student stations in New Zealand and they wanted a track and we gave them this track, it was, was, was pretty cool and they said, oh, what's your name? And we don't have a name, so we just kind of... So, yeah, just call it Fat Freddy's and um, it's kind of stuck. I just, yeah, the, the aim was definitely to lose, lose that name and come up with a proper name, but um, it just, and just never, never, never went away. <laughs> Okay, but we, we just tell the press that, that you we know, kind of don't want to push that whole <coughs> drug thing with our music, but uh, we just tell the press, yeah, it's the Fairy Freak Brothers. Uh, yeah, well, probably the name for the asset came from the Fairy Freak Brothers. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So indirectly, uh, it's the truth, yeah, for sure. Um, and my second question was um, about when you perform live with CMPC, do you usually load like one file with different drum kits and, and stuff or do you like load several files in a row? Um, each song we have its own program and yeah so there's like if I've got uh, I could normally fit um, half the set on, on one load so it'll be maybe five tunes um, and so there'll be five different kits and five different sequences, and then um, and then I'm, mad, I'm madly reloading halfway through our set. Usually, there's one song that we use during the set, which is called "Roadie," and we'll start with a very kind of jammy horn a cappella while I'm reloading, and then <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> Since you have such a large group of people uh, with the band traveling around, have you ever had a phase where you say, okay, for now people are busy, so we only play with part of the band, or you just turn down a show or a tour? If not, everyone can do it. Um, we're pretty, no, we kind of, um, we pretty staunchly stick to the seven piece, and that's kind of, we can't do it, and we can't do it, and, um, yeah, it's funny. I mean, that's that's the norm. But uh, unfortunately, if we're about to head to Europe again just for a short trip, and our horn player, one of our horn players, can't make it, and so he, he's going to miss the first gig or two, and that's kind of the first time that this has happened. Um, but yeah, pretty much staunchly stick to the seven piece, and that's it. Are you drafting someone in for that, or are you just going to just have be? Um, no, we're just going to try and uh, we'll just try and wing it without him. Killer. Yeah. Okay. It, won't, it definitely won't be the same. It'll be, but it'll be, it'll be something different. It'll be something cool. I mean, we kind of 
stick to that uh, whole band or nothing. Just it's quite hard to articulate why, but there is something. There is some sort of freaky live magic that exists when we all play, and there's no, and there's no point in trying to do it without anyone. You know. Hello. Um, because of that, did you did people find it hard when you're in the studio? If people are so used to playing, because you know musicians when they're playing, they're kind of vibing off of each other. So did did everybody find it hard if you were going in and there's just you know the one kind of track playing and people are going in on their own, or did you try and keep it that there was a couple of people playing each time? Yeah, and initially we started off very much um, quite separately. Would have the basic rhythm track and Pro Tools, and uh, a couple of horns would come in and do their parts, and then the vocalists would come on on another day and do their part, and the guitarist. And all, it was all initially quite separate, and then uh, we we kind quite found later on that it didn't really have that much vibe, and was a little bit. So we we kind of went around in circles. We started off like that, and then would come back and uh, get all the horns uh, on a couple of occasions, get the horns to come back and stand in front of one mic and just play it together and um, that's like I was saying earlier, we went through a whole lot of processes and kind of kept on... And I think that was a good thing about having our own studios that we could learn a lot and actually experiment and work out what was best. But a lot, yeah, initially it was a lot, lot of stuff done separately and <coughs> having to come back and do it together. Is there a track that you're most proud of? Um, Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty proud of the. I'm pretty proud of the whole the whole album, really. To be honest, I think yeah. Mm -hmm. It's um. I mean, that's what. It's not perfect. Not, none of it. I mean, that's kind of you always got to leave room. That's the whole thing about making music is there's uh, always room for improvement. And uh, if, if you ran out of room for improvement, then you might as well do something else. I mean, I've always kind of put it in the context that this is where, my, where our skills, my skills are at this point and this is what we've produced and that's cool and then move on, learn new lessons and, and, and look to improve but I, generally I'm pretty proud of everything we've done so far. And when you listen to the album now, you know, when you're walking in supermarkets in New Zealand or, you know, Tesco's in London, um, when it's playing in the background, what kind of thoughts go through your mind? Yeah, they're, they're, they're moments of where I'm proud, you know, like, uh, especially back home, it's just, we're kind of like the cafe kings back home. You know, you walk into every cafe in a major city in Wellington, oh, in, in New Zealand, and it's just, usually that first album, especially that first album, just because it's four tracks that play for 80 minutes, uh, that just suits cafes very well. And yeah, those are usually pretty proud moments, and, you know, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that's great. I mean, we want to sort of maintain some underground integrity, but you know, at the same time, we, we're making music for people to hear it, and the more, you know, if it can be heard every, everywhere, that's great, I reckon. Well, it's trying to strike that balance, isn't it? Yeah. Because you know, on one hand, you know, it's good that people hear good music, especially in this day and age. Yeah. But at the same time, I think that's why for me, it's interesting this whole kind of idea of the whole underground thing. I think underground is. In terms of perspective and what you're trying to achieve, I think definitely it shouldn't be underground. I think it should be definitely overground. Yeah, I mean, the, what's overground and what's mainstream at the moment, I'm pretty sure it exists outside New Zealand as well. There's just so much rubbish on the charts, and uh, it's not like that people... That's just what people are fed, so that's all that people know. And if you can actually get in a position to push good music into people that don't know otherwise, then it's got to be healthy. I mean, because the masses are just getting fed rubbish. And so if, you, yeah, if you're in a position to feed them something that's a wee bit different, a wee bit uh, better, then it's got to be good. But, you know, the fact that you've had a number one, isn't it quite possible that, you know, Fat Freddy's job could be mainstream? In the sense of sales, in terms of profile, not necessarily music type. Yeah, well, if that's, if that's the case, then that'll be great, I reckon. I wouldn't have a problem with that if we didn't have to change the music that we make. And certainly, uh, we're reaching those sort of sales back in New Zealand. I mean, they're up there. They're up there I think. Um, 
when we left New Zealand, when I left New Zealand to come here, our album was sitting at kind of over 40,000 records, and for a country that's small as New Zealand, that's pretty that's good. That's great. You know? all, from your, all from the beach? All, all from the beach. Dis- dis- yeah. dis- that's great. And, um, yeah, for a country our size, that's, that's huge. And, uh, and it won't stop, it'll, it'll keep on going, I think, you know. To every household in the late nation. <laughs> to every cafe. <laughs> that's and, a cool yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask a question. Uh, you mentioned before about your mics and that you've got really good mics. Can you tell us a little bit about your mics and are there certain mics that are more specific for recording vocals and, and ones that are, um, you know, for recording, say, the horn section or, I mean, yeah, tell um, us a bit about that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of auditioned a lot of mics pre-writing the album and um, uh, Try a lot of classic stuff like uh, a U87, a Neumann U87. Tried some fairly high-end AKG mics, some 414s, and uh, I unfortunately couldn't get my hands on a, a U47, which would have been cool. But um, in the end, I went for a, as a main vocal mic. I went for a, a, what's a company called Blue Microphones, and they make it. They make the kind of most top-end non-tube mic, which is called the Kiwi. Um, is that a bit of an irony there? Eh? Is that, is that some irony? Because it's called Kiwi. Was that your, that was just that your total, main reason? That was a total coincidence. It was <laughs> Blue Microphones is a company that I think is Latvian, and I used to make the, uh, the capsules for Neumann back in the day, and they went off and set up their own company, and they had all these fruity names for the different ranges in the, within their mics, and it just happened to be called a Kiwi. And uh, so that was kind of what I'd settled on as a, that's what sounded the best to me. Um, and in the end, kind of, just because it's a home studio, uh, we used the Kiwi on a lot, of, a lot of the album. If I had the resources and had the money, I probably would have gone for, uh, for the horns. I would have used ribbon mics, probably would have gone for some Royers. But, um, Unfortunately, there's only, you can't just, there's not that many places where you can just go and hire flash mics or uh, you can buy them, but you can't just sort of go and hire, hire stuff out. So kind of found one really good condenser and, and was, uh, had to use it on most things. Okay. And where did you record everything in the basement? Yeah, it's just uh, it's a one bedroom bed sit with a lounge, a separate bedroom and a kitchen upstairs. And I um, turned the bedroom into the recording booth and the lounge into the control room and yeah, and, uh, closed the door and pushed record. And that's kind of it did, did everything in there, everything from drums to horns to like on the album. We used the MPC for uh, the live show, but a, a lot of live bass and a lot of uh, drums that make it onto the record. Okay, well it didn't? Did. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, bro, um, on the way over here on the, on the plane in New Zealand, in the little back there, they had all the, the audio channels you could listen to on the, the headphones and stuff, and channel 15 was Fat Freddy's Drop. So right. I basically had a whole bunch of the album, some of the old stuff, some of the recluse stuff with Dallas on it and kind of like, you know, related kind of Fat Freddy's drop tunes. I just wanted to, um, yeah, just ask if you make a lot of money through the licensing, if that's one of your kind of financial, you know, outlets, because uh, there's heaps of compilations with tracks on it. I just wondered if that's like a really viable option in terms of trying to make some, make some money back to sort of, you know, advance. Yeah, I don't know if we, I'm not too sure if, I didn't even know that was a, Situation, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, guess, oh, I could be wrong. But I think, I mean, because it's public performance, that maybe the f- yeah. because they've paid their APRA in New Zealand. They're kind of it's called APRA, who look after uh, collecting money for artists. Um, I think maybe they're just allowed to to do that. Are you guys published? No, we haven't got a publisher yet. Okay. But, uh, we're, yeah, we're all, we're almost signed a publishing deal, just a, an, an administration published deal, publishing deal, just to get us through the next couple of years before we sign to a major. And that, will that be an equal split as well in terms of writing? Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. for sure. We, we kind of think, it, yeah, it's important that everything remains fairly down the middle for That's everybody, good. just to keep 
keep that creative vibe there. Sure. It's very admirable, definitely, in these times. Um, I'd like to hear something else, actually. You want to hear something else? Yeah. Um. You say that you're um, a superstar. What's that? A superstar. Oh, I'm fairly well known in New Zealand. So when you're walking yeah, down the street, people know who you are. It's getting a bit, it's getting a bit strange like that. Yeah, they're starting, uh, people starting to recognise me down at the supermarket. <laughs> Only because we've got a video out, we've we put, put our first proper video out not that long ago. And we feature heavily in the video and the oh, video is nice. getting quite major play on, on TV back home. This is one of my more favourite tunes on the album that no one's really seemed to have found.
That's the more sensitive side of Fat Freddy's drop. <laughs> so, can you talk us through how that was put together? Uh, that, was, that, that, was, that was actually a really fun track to work on in the studio. We kind of, uh, kind of constructed it and read it, wrote, wrote it in the studio, but it um, was one of the few um, tunes that uh, was big, long takes. Um, Probably, uh, we, a lot of a lot of comping and editing, editing was involved in the vocals on the album, you know, taking uh, little bits here and there from all different sorts of takes. Whereas the vocal on that track was pretty much um, from start to finish. Uh, the bass was the same, and the horns. So okay. it was, uh, with a little bit of construction with the beats, but pretty much uh, everybody playing right from start to finish. And it was all done within Pro Tools? Yeah, that's so, all Pro Tools. You've got, you got a really warm sound for, for using Pro Tools. I mean, what kind of plug plugins did you use for, say, the compression? Um, my, my main... Um, I used the Sony Oxford um, plugins, which is... They've got a great EQ and compressor as my main... Just my main... Uh, yeah, the, the Sony Oxford stuff is the main plugin I use with a little bit of... Um, some of the uh, mastering stuff from Waves, okay. like um, uh, C4 and the L2. Okay. But um, main, mainly, mainly Sony. I've only got two lots of plugins that I brought. I kind of have, I've got a laptop that I've got thousands of dollars worth of crack plugins on, on, but I've got, in the studio, I use a fairly clean G5 with stuff I brought, and that's uh, just Sony and Waves. Okay. And for the delay, kind of dubby delay, what do you tend to use for that? Um, I either use uh, tape delay, uh, I'm right into tape echoes, uh, like the Roland 555 or the 501. You own one of those, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've got one of each. Or just a quickie, which is kind of a good trick, I reckon, is usually just using the digi design d delay, which sounds pretty terrible, but on the return channel, if you kind of slap something like amplitude or some fil filthy filter, it kind of hides it from being, you know. Kind of makes it sound a wee bit like a tape, tape delay. You know? Kind of make it a bit more coarse and a bit yeah. more kind of analog. Okay. Killer. I was going to ask about the, uh, the songwriting process. I mean, how does uh, Dallas approach that? And uh, is that just his own thing, or does everyone have a hand in it? And uh, I don't know, does he, does he kind of work out something beforehand, or does he hear the music and then it comes from there? How does that work? Uh, it usually comes. Uh, the lyrics are totally his, 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 his thing, he, he writes all the lyrics, um, but they're usually inspired by uh, a jam with the band, we'll, be, we'll come up with some new jam and that'll set some tone or some mood, some vibe, and then he'll, um, he'll just sit there within the corner of the room with a pen and paper while we're jamming and, um, and write some lyrics and then... Um, and it's just to and fro, and he'll, he'll find a chorus, find a verse, and then suggest some changes in the music to, to suit the lyrics he's just written, but it's all, it's all pretty natural, and 
Yeah, and it usually comes off the back of the music. The music's usually first. Hi. Uh, would you say that your live shows kind of changed since releasing the album in terms of that a lot of the people, especially maybe touring <coughs> England, say, have heard the album and they want to hear the tracks from the album? Would you say your, your live sets, the songs are actually finishing now rather than doing the 30-minute the rollover into the next track? Have, have you f kind of found it's changed? Yeah, it's... Uh, with, it's um yeah, it's definitely had to change a wee bit to, to cater for the slightly, um, just because in New Zealand now, I've, uh, we kind of started like that CD when I played earlier from Live the Matterhorn was 20 people, 30 people on a Sunday night, all probably stoned and drinking whiskey and just, uh, now in New Zealand we're doing shows in town halls to quite big numbers and you kind of uh, have to give the, we feel like we have to give the set a wee bit more shape than, uh, than we used to, and um, that's kind of yeah, that, that's that's the the, the downside of uh, I suppose getting popular within you know, within New Zealand is having to. But still, I mean, the this, the songs are still they've gone from being 30 to 40 minutes down to 15 to 20 minutes, so you know it's kind of uh, we, we made some compromise there, but. Uh, <laughs> And, and unfortunately, what we used to do a lot is uh, just that day I kind of come up with a really cool sample I found at home on a record and dial it up and quickly put a kick and a snare to it and then play that that night with the band. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't get to happen as much because you know, people want to hear some of the songs. That's, that's a bit sad. So what's yes, it has changed a wee bit. What's the chat that people keep on asking for? Um, people... Uh, People always ask, ask for hope and for Midnight Marauders and we very seldomly play them. Uh, that's kind of just us being stubborn, they're the kind of songs that we're done with. We didn't put them on the album. Um, and yeah, it's very much, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, maintained a bit of an attitude that's also our music and we'll play what's we, we, we want to play at the time and Midnight Mortars and Hope are songs that we kind of, we've done and dusted a few years ago and uh, we're happy to release them on compilations but we're not kind of that happy to play them anymore. We usually, if a gig goes off, especially overseas and uh, it rocks, uh, we use them as encore tunes, like oh, Midnight okay. Mortars, or, but they, they're, they're definitely not on the set these days. So how does it work with seven people doing an encore? Do you all, do you all go off and all come back on or do you to kind of hide behind your instruments or something? Um, yeah, we'd all just get off, and then, uh, yeah, we don't kind of look to do an encore, but if, if, if it's there, then we'll, we'll do it. Okay. Is there any other questions at the moment? I just want to ask, um, if, if there's anything else in the pipeline aside from uh, that Freddy's drop? Well, you know, remixes or any... Yeah, uh, um, there's a bunch of remixes coming out soon that other people done for us. Um, yeah, I'd love to get to a point where I can um, get back in the studio and do some non fat free drop stuff, either being remixes of other people or just taking a break. And we're trying to fit it all in. It's just time, really. You know, it's just... Uh, yeah, once... Outside of family, fat free just drop. Uh, it's just not that much time, really. But yeah, definitely an attempt to try to, for sure. Have you got like a routine to the, the way you kind of combine family life with studio life, fat free just drop life? Um, I've kind of designed my life, it's kind of, it's good. I've kind of, because um, I've got the studio downstairs, I've got a fairly good work ethic, I've worked long hours and um, but how I do is I'll, because uh, I, I work from home, my daughter's six and I get to see, you know, I get to probably, she probably gets to see her dad more often than most Coaching. most kids would probably, because I, I kind of do a 10, 10 hour day, or eight hour day every day that might take 15 hours to do. 
I'll go downstairs, do some work, come back, come up, come back upstairs, hang out with my kid for a bit, go back down, do another couple of hours. You know, at, at the important times that I need to be with my daughter, it's kind of when I when, when I am, sure. and then she goes to bed at 6:37, and then and I kind of get out of the studio at midnight, and sort of by the end of the day, I've done a kind of eight-hour day. You know. Okay. Does she ever get to go down to the basement? Yeah, she's her, she's got some. Yeah, her and her, all the local neighbourhood kids have made it on, made it into Pro Tools many, <laughs> many many a times. That's cool. Yeah. Have you um, found any other kind of up-and-coming Kiwis? Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of good stuff coming uh, to, to look out for. There's a lot of really good singers to look out for. Um, some of the people that were involved uh, on our album, just as guest, guest musos, uh, a good rapper by the name of Lady Six. Um, I think I might be involved next year and have given her a hand to put, put out an album. Um, Is that going to come up on the drop, maybe? Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, but kind of the drop has never really um, had the intention of being a label. It's always kind of like being a, business, a little small business set up to run the, the matters for Fat Fridge Drop. But um, there's kind of a need for a bit of a label to happen down under that's got, uh, you know, the, the, to just to help people put out some, some sure. stuff because there's a lot of single artists that don't have a full band that are just good vocalists that need need a bit of, need a bit of help. And obviously they, they're going to look up to you because I think that you've definitely, you know, changed things in New Zealand in lots of ways. And the fact yeah, that yeah. We've, it's been good. It's been good to be a part of a, a changing. Yeah, it feels like there's a lot of change happening in the New Zealand music industry at the moment. It's good to be feel like we're involved in that. You know? mm -hmm. I quite like to play a remix that's just okay. come back. Who, just, who did it? This is a friend of mine. Uh, talking of up, up, up and coming people, this is a, a producer in New Zealand who I rate probably one of the best in the country. And he's just remixed. Um, I'll, just, I'll play a quick snippet of the track that he's remixed just so you can yeah. see where it's gone. I don't know if it was available outside of New Zealand, but a killer hip-hop album that kind of uh, did really well in New Zealand, and he raps both in English and in Samoan. And, and what was the name of the artist? Uh, his, this guy, his name's uh, Submariner. And the, the rapper you are uh, Kaz. Kaz. The Feel Style. Okay. Nice, man. Thanks mm. for sharing that. Is that going to be out soon? That, yeah, well, our next single in the, will be coming out in the UK will be the, uh, the album version and that remix. Is that going to be available in New Zealand? Uh, that'll as well, be, then? Yeah, that'll be available hopefully everywhere. Yeah, it'll come out. New Zealanders will have to import it. Why is that? Uh, just because uh, we don't, we don't really, I mean, singles are obviously a good way of pushing an album, sales for an album, whereas we don't really need too much help in New Zealand. This is an initiative, the, the single idea as an English initiative that they, they're doing, so they, they, they're bringing out a, a, a 12 with the album version and a remix. Okay. Yeah. So there'll be some eBay fodder for the Fred for these fans yeah, yeah. at home. Um, I was going to ask you, um, what was the story about the album getting mastered in um, San Fran? Um, yeah, in, in New Zealand, everything is very DIY. There's uh, lots of people who, like us, who just produce bedroom producers that produce stuff at home in the basement and I mean, that, that's fine, but there's no, there's no one with any experience or the gear to master records um, on our side of the world generally, I reckon. I mean, there's certainly no one on, in New Zealand. People would argue that there's someone, some people in Australia. I, I would tend to disagree. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't trust my record with anyone in Australia. Um, so, yeah, I jumped on a plane and went to San Francisco and... Um, yeah, I mean, this just a friend of mine was living in San Fran quite a long time ago, and uh, he was working in a record shop and also working for a label, and he put together a compilation, and um, he suggested using uh, this guy George Horn, who's quite a quite an old school, quite a famous uh, uh, engineer f in San Fran, who's, who goes right back with the Fantasy Studios, uh, with, with a very long. Uh, 
history in, in that area with jazz records, soul, and funk, and I've been around s since the 70s. And, um, and I've, he used to master a lot of, not, not so much anymore, but he used to master a lot of the ubiquity stuff. Um, and I just kind of thought he was an appropriate master to use this because he was dealing with both DJ records and live instrument records and that's kind of, we're kind of uh, a bit like that, you know, so stylistically, so I thought, um, give it a go. And he did Marauders way back in the day, Midnight Marauders way back in the day and he did a great job and we just thought, you know, we'll just go back to this guy because he's going to be better than anyone in, in, in New Zealand. And how was that whole um, experience for you being in the master room while, while he was kind of mastering your, you guys' baby? Yeah, it was good. Um, he's an old guy. He's really old. He's like probably, well, not like really old, but he, you know, he kind of walks with a limp and he kind of looks like he's about 70, 80. And okay. He's an old guy sitting behind his console and puts, puts our dad on and just cranks it right up. You know, it's just <laughs> a, a, a volume that was probably too loud for me. And uh, he's just this little guy hiding behind this console. Does that sound good? <laughs> yeah, it sounds great and cool. I mean, you make a big difference to the record, do you think? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, for sure. He just had the experience of knowing what, what, what frequencies to, to tickle and what, what, to, what to compress. And just, he basically just gave it a good squash and, and turned it up. And, uh, he was good. He didn't want to change too much. He just wanted to get a hold of the bottom end and make sure it wasn't too loose, and, sure. and pretty much leave it as it was. And um, yeah, that was a good experience. I mean, I didn't want to. You know, I was going to him for a reason. I didn't really want to get too much involved and ask too many questions. You know, and uh, had had, a, had had it been a situation where I wasn't liking what I was hearing, I definitely would have jumped in there and said something. But. It sounded great, and I just let him do it. But I needed to go to somewhere outside New Zealand, someone that had analog gear, and because you know, it was an album that essentially was digitally recorded, and just felt like it needed to have a pass at some point on the way out that was analog. And, Most and did you master to um, to um, to bat dat again after? Yeah, he goes from yeah, dat to dat. Just had two dat okay. players for an old Sony console. Um, not too much outboard, it was most of it was just the EQ on the console and uh, the only thing he had is he had a um, the only modern thing that he had was his, um, his limiter was a, a, the hardware version of the L2. Okay. Yeah, he had a... Had a the Waves thing? Yeah, the yeah. Waves and the Waves L2 was his only kind of modern part of the chain. So you were a very happy man on the way back from San Fran, I guess. Yeah, it was cool. I was kind of listening to it on my iPod on the way back, just you know, flicking between the newly mastered record and other stuff on my iPod, and it all sounded good. And is that something you would definitely do in the future? Always kind of master your record outside of New Zealand? Yeah. It's, just, um, it's more than just the gear, it's the experience. Um, but I, don't, I don't feel I'd necessarily have to go back to George, but I think you've just got to go back to... You've got to go somewhere where the, where the person who's mastering the record he or she is, you know, of reasonable age and has been doing this for a while and um, has the ears and, uh, and, and, and has, has the gear. It's, it's that both of those things don't exist in New Zealand. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been really enjoying uh, the mastering at the Sonar Collective. People get all their stuff mastered at a place called Calix. Uh, it's in Berlin, isn't in it? Berlin, yeah. yeah, by a guy called Bo Codron. I would, I would be, personally, I would feel happy jumping on a plane and going to Germany as opposed to America. I mean, it's just got to go somewhere where, where someone's got the, it's got, it's got the ears, really. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've been enjoying their mastering a lot lately. Is this, do you think it's something that you'd add to your, you know, into your um, list of experiences and things that you want to get into, the whole mastering thing? Cause you yeah, I eventually wouldn't, wouldn't mind. I mean, it's, it's something, I, I kind of do a lot of mastering for people in New Zealand just... Uh, inside Pro Tools at home, just for people that don't have, um, I think I, have a, I don't have the gear or the experience, but I have a fairly good ear for mastering and I kind of end up doing a fair bit of it for compilations back home in New Zealand because a lot of people don't have uh, the resources to um, money or the, yeah, mainly the money to go get it done properly. 
like when people come to me and ask me, can you, could you master the single for me so I can get on radio? I, you know, I usually go to them, I, I, can, I can probably give you a hand, but usually suggest to, suggest to them that they should go to a proper mastering house and get it done. But then it's usually pretty obvious pretty quickly that they don't have the money to do that. Right. And then I'll usually just kind of squash it and turn it up for them and just so it sits at a, right, at a good level. You know, but uh, eventually it would be to do it properly with uh, outboard gear would be definitely something we'd like to do later on for sure. Start building the kind of yeah. analog Ross um, yeah. equipment list. Is there any kind of equipment that you're after at the moment? Yeah, I really want to buy an analog console. Um, Trident have just put out these, um, these new, new desks called uh, a part of the Dream series, they call them. Okay. And um, yeah, they're just, uh, yeah, would like to definitely want to get more analog on it, uh, move, move a wee bit out of the box. And I, actually, I sat here on Friday and listened to uh, the, uh, f it was a Matthew, uh, and who doesn't use a computer, and I was actually stylistically not uh, so much where I'm at, but listening to his music when he played it, it was huge, it was fat, and, and it's, it's because he didn't mix it within a computer. You know? I think uh, it's kind of a, I wouldn't mind going, looking at going down that road and actually taking, taking it out of, maybe using Pro Tools as the way to record things, but definitely get it out of the box and onto a desk. Sure. And um, mix and uh, go straight to DAT, or, you know, get out of the, get out of the computer. And yeah, you know, and, and I found me listening to Matthew talk about how he makes it. All kind of was quite interested in that whole chain. Yeah. yeah. So that means getting another you know interface for Pro Tools, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, how many would it? Eight channels, sixteen, cha twenty-four channels. Yeah, I've got a I've got a um, Rosetta eight hundred uh, Apogee and uh, A to D, D to A. Uh, on the front end of Pro Tools, so I can get in and out quite quite easily and quite high end. So it'll just be a matter of uh, I'll be restricted to eight outs, but it'll work. Yeah. But it'll work. You know, you just just have stereo four stereo pairs of your main elements coming back into a disc and <coughs> just to get that kind of warmth, I guess, and yeah. definition. Cool. Anyone got any other questions? There was a quote that you um I, I sort of kind of saw. I, li I really like this. It said um hold on. Uh, take your time and be confident with your decisions. Uh, confidence is based on research and thought. Don't uh, don't want to make too many mistakes. Where was that from? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that's kind of uh, that's the um, I don't know, that's kind of how we try to live our lives. Yeah, um, Life, you know, in this business making music, it's just so hectic and so busy that you don't want to, you haven't got time to make too many mistakes. And I think you're kind of better in taking your time and researching all the, and having a look at all the options, uh, be that creatively in the studio or be that uh, from a business point of view. Um, just take your time and, and, uh, and it's worked for us many times. We've kind of been, like you said earlier, we've had lots of major labels sniffing around, trying to entice us into going down this particular road. And, and, and at first, and on the surface, it looks like, shit, we should go down this, this is great, this is a great deal, this is great, whatever, we should go down this road. And then every time we haven't done that and, and stuck to our guns and done it our own way, every time we look six months later down the road and looked at the other option, had we gone down there, it, all t it would have all turned to shit. Sure. And I suppose that's probably what I was trying to say there, just, yeah, just uh, back yourself and your decisions, and as long as you've taken time and uh, to think about them, then that, you know that you've got to, you've got to back yourself. Me, thank you very much indeed. Nice.